now we're going to talk about orthoses and bracing. Um, some people say orthotics. I suppose it's just nomenclature. I'm a little bit of a stickler on that. They are orthoses, not orthotics. Orthotic is something you get from the podiatrist who is also not a medical doctor. Just, just, just saying, okay? Um, so uh, uh, first of all, in, in my opinion, a uh, wheelchair basically is essentially a total body orthosis. So we, when we name um, uh, orthoses, they are named for the part of the body that they are covering. So this is me being facetious. Um, it's not really a TBO, it's, that's, but it really is. So, so wheelchairs have all these supportive uh, points on them, you know, the chest harness, the, uh, you know, the straps for the ankles to hold people in and whatnot. And, and really they do support the, the whole body. Um, but um, basically when you are fitting an orthosis, these guys will tell you from Fisher and Hennett, um, the, uh, there are basic, basic biomechanical principles that they are doing to fit it properly. We as prescribers of this equipment have to understand some of the biomechanical principles necessary to do this, and you have to understand what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to hold them up or support them, prevent deformity, correct deformity, different things like that, okay? So you need to know the different things that are available, what they can be made of. They can be plastic, they can be carbon fiber, they can have metal hinges, they can have different kinds of supports. p -Lite, which is a rubbery um, padding in there, they can have all that different stuff. When to replace them, how to write the prescription, how to, how to tell the orthotist who's making it what it is exactly that you want. Sometimes you can just write on the prescription. The, the uh, insurance companies don't care. You can say, brace to keep foot in neutral. They'll know what that means. Could they do that? Would that yes. get approved? Yes. Um, so um, already we've talked a little bit about the uh, rockers of gait. Um, and again, there's not going to be a quiz at the end. Um, I think, though, that this, you know, if you could refer back to it, I have a little bit in here. If you, um, eventually, I'm sure the Norton website will get caught up to us and they'll get everything on there. So if you, could, you can print all these things out. I'm not going to go through all this individually. Um, I threw this one in here for you because up there in, in – uh, um, Wisconsin and Minnesota with all the uh, uh, Gillette, you know, wave that extends out from there, the, the, pre, the five prerequisites for uh, normal gait. Uh, Jim Gage used to say that he could wake, he would like to shake his residents awake at two o'clock in the morning and they would just say, stability and stance, clearance and swing. Uh, if I, you know, so they, they could, he could shake them awake in the middle of the night and they could name five uh, prerequisites for normal gait. Um, I think that's great. So, but that's, those are the things we're trying to accomplish. Um, so any, what is the problem? I told you earlier, it's, a, it's incredible we can get these kids to wear these braces, especially considering they're hard to put on, especially when you can't use your hands normally. They're hard to take off. They make you hot. They don't go cute with shoes. They really don't look all that great with a mini skirt. You know, it's stuff like that that's a little bit difficult. Um, plus they make the part that they're covering stiffer. Sometimes that's the point though. Just saying. Um, so how to stabilize a joint? When you stabilize a joint, you want to use a three-point support system. Um, just like for anything, you know, if I'm going to try to prevent my elbow from flexing, I'm going to want to push down here and down here. But even if I only push in those two spots, I'm still going to be able to bend it because nobody's pushing up here, right? So you have to have pressure on three places to keep me from bending my elbow. And that's basically how it's done, is when you put on, when you mold for a brace, the orthotist is going to use a three-point bending um, pressure to, to mold the brace. The most common type of brace is a solid ankle AFO, Vanna. Um, so a solid ankle AFO has a, has a, uh, a more anterior trim line, so it is, it's solid. Um, when, they, when the kids try to walk on it, it doesn't doesn't give very much. It's buckling a little bit here in the sides, but it has to be a little thin to allow them to walk. Um, you want the, the plastic to be strong enough that it holds them, um, but not so strong that it makes them look like Frankenstein. We don't really want them to be so stiff. So this does have some give. See, I can twist it around, and if I push hard enough, I can buckle it. It gets wider at the ankle as it buckles forward. So this is not going to be good in a chubby kid. They're going to break it down and crack the plastic pretty quickly. 
So when, they, when they're bigger, we can give extra reinforcement on that to help that. Um, but this is a, a solid ankle AFO. This is classic. If you, write the, if you just write on a prescription AFO, this is basically when you, what you're going to get. If it's for you, they can take off the Hello Kitty. <laughs> or they can put whatever on it you want. Um, so uh, what do we use those for? We use those to prevent um, people from pointing their toes down. Sometimes we're preventing them from voluntarily pointing their toes down, like in the idiopathic toe walking that Dr. Moyer was talking about. Sometimes we're just trying to catch their toe from going down if they have dorsiflexor weakness. Sometimes we're trying to cause them to be stiff, like if they have spina bifida and they need to be held up in that position with some support. Okay, so that's basically what that is for. So it affects all the phases of gait. Um, what about a hinged? Oh, see, I skipped that one. That one's coming next. So uh, this, what about a, a hinged AFO? A hinged AFO has joints in the sides and it'll, it will stop you to catch you. It can still keep you from drooping your toes down, but has a hinge to allow flexion of the ankle like that. But you can't go down into a toe point. Ah, there we go. You can't go down into a toe point, okay? So that seems like that'd be a good idea, but we're gonna address that here in a minute. I mostly I just wanna get the, the uh, thoughts down. The idea behind this is the hinge is supposed to be right at the, at the center of motion of the ankle joint. And so as the kid grows and gets taller, all of a sudden their ankle is up here instead of down here. So this needs to be replaced relatively frequently. Um, and then they have this, which I'm not really sure what anybody would use this for. Not a fan, just saying. So this one also lets you go down and lets you go up. So we could just take it off and let them walk. Okay. Um, no, there are reasons for it. I don't use it very much. Um, so uh, uh, the a hinged AFO is most, most appropriate for someone who actually has fairly good, fairly good neurologic function. It's pretty good in an, in an idiopathic toe walker. The hinges are pretty wide though, and so they don't like them because then they can't fit them in their cool shoes. Um, and it's, it's really good, it's perfect. An artic articulated ankle AFO is perfect for somebody who has a foot drop. So maybe they have a perineal nerve injury from a compartment syndrome or from an errant surgery or from a lawnmower injury. I've had all these things, okay? Not me personally, you know, my patients. Um, but that, that's what it's perfect for. But it is contraindicated, this is listed as a contraindication, spe significant spasticity or clonus of the ankle. So this is not indicated in CP. So 98% of my patients can't wear it. Um, a posterior leaf spring, and I have more pictures up here here in a minute, but a posterior leaf spring is the same as the solid. Hand me that solid one too, Marcel. It's in the oh, it went away, okay. So the solid one had anterior trim lines. This plastic around the back came around further, and so because it, the solid one is more like a cylinder, it's stiffer, but this one has a thinner trim line in the back, so what happens when I push on this one, I don't have to push very hard, and it lets it go, right? So, but it won't let it go fast. I can't go slamming down on it with the hinges. There's some resistance depending on how thick the plastic is in the back. And that resistance allows it to slow down dorsiflexion so you're not getting that clonus response that you get with a rapid stretch. Just seeing what, the, what my options are back over there. Um, so a foot orthosis is what's most commonly called an orthotic. Um, it, Foot orthosis means it's just only supporting the foot. An AFO is an ankle foot orthosis. Um, this is just a foot orthosis, so it's just an orthotic. And that all it's to do is really kind of make the foot more comfortable. Um, it works in every phase of gait. Um, so let's talk about some specifics. So in a crouch gait, a crouch gait is where your heels are on the ground, but your knees are bent. This is an old, old picture from like a 100-year-old year old textbook, but it, it's so perfect. There's, no, there's nothing better than that. So sometimes the, the, it's, you get a crouch gait because some overzealous orthopedic surgeon has lengthened the heel cords three or four times and now they can't, can't push their uh, tibias back up. So you can either use a long leg brace like this with lock, drop lock hinges, those, those lock out an extension. When the, to sit down, they have to reach down and pull those little things up and allow the knee to passively flex when they sit down. So that's a, a straight leg brace with drop lock hinges. These down here would be hooked to either a shoe or hooked to an AFO down at the ankle. Or you can maybe, if the, if the knee is the primary problem, you might use a custom 
uh, knee brace like this, or this is one that comes from the fancy kids orthotic uh, company called a HECO, H-E-K-O. It's a uh, hyperextension, hyperextension knee orthosis. You're probably not gonna remember that, so you just say, you know, knee brace to, to prevent hyperextension. But they're hinged, it allows motion, it's pretty good. All this stuff is gonna be out there at the table for you guys to play with. And this is, the, this is just an, an orthotic or foot orthosis that holds you. This one has cork on the bottom. Insurance companies won't pay for these, just so you know. Um, they, uh, if you have a uh, flexible spending account or health savings account, you can usually pay for, that, for this out of that if you have a prescription, but it will not be paid for by standard insurances um, unless they have plastic on them and come up at least a little bit higher on the ankle. So um, one of the most common reasons to order an AFO is for this. This is a kid who's walking on his toes. This is mild diplegic CP. So this kid is walking up on their toes and this is an x-ray done with the kid standing. And so you can see this is the position the child stands in. Isn't that cute? I just think that's so cute that we got a picture and the kid was on their toes. Um, it was an accident. You know, the x-ray tech was like, oh, well, that's the way they stood. You know, they can go down, but they just didn't. So the important thing here is the angle that you, you look at this and see it. Then over time, the child went to therapy and they had maybe some serial casting and whatnot. And so as they got older, they looked like this. Hey, that's better, right? Um, the hind foot's in some valgus. You can see the, like the outside of the foot's a little off the ground. And the little prominence here, and they're coming in now because they have they have pain here when they, <coughs> when they walk. Um, the key here is that in these two x-rays, the tibia and the talus are almost exactly the same alignment that they were before. So if you look at that, the tibia and the talus are almost parallel, and they're still almost parallel. The difference is that the talus and the first metatarsal when he was younger were still in proper alignment. But now, not so much, okay? Those two lines are supposed to be parallel. So what's happened is now that's broken down through the midfoot and all those ligaments in the middle of the foot that used to, have, used to hold stability, the foot have broken down. And this, this is not prevented if you wear a hinged brace. This is prevented with a posterior leaf spring or a solid ankle AFO, but it is not prevented with a hinged brace or no brace, okay? So again, this is the uh, solid ankle AFO this is the posterior leaf spring AFO. So uh, this is how it starts. This is a solid kind of construct before they've trimmed it out. And when they make the posterior leaf spring, they just cut further back here to make it so that it springs a little bit in the back. Um, so everybody kind of, as, as our technology and our equipment has improved and available uh, structure and, and things have improved. We've we got some fancy things now that we can put in braces, so they don't have to be plastic anymore. This is carbon fiber, like a ski, um, and so it can be much smaller and lower profile, and it still gives that leaf spring. So why why not have just a simple lightweight leaf spring like that behind you? Well, that's great. It doesn't, but it doesn't hold the foot, right? So you can't really maintain the shape of the foot. But what you can do is take this nice lightweight leaf spring, which can either be in the front or the back, and you can add to it maybe a shorter version of the plastic thing that goes inside the, inside the shoe. This shorter version is called an SMO, supramalleolar orthoses, um, and it goes along with the black part. And the, you, the black part is you can put carbon fiber AFO. It's a toe off, walk on. They all have silly names associated with them. It doesn't really matter. Your orthotist will know. Um, and then you can, you've got the Cadillac. This is a crazy, amazing brace, in my opinion. It is huge, so um, you know they might call it their, Frank, their Frankenstein foot or their Terminator boot or something like that. But um, it's big, but what it is is this black thing that you can barely see here is actually long like this, and it is a flex foot from a um, prosthesis. So if you have somebody who had their foot cut off so they don't have a foot, the foot we give them is much better than some of my patient's feet that they still have, except that my patient maybe can feel their feet. Sometimes not all of them, okay? So how come we're giving better feet to people who don't have feet than we can give to people who do have feet? That seems unfair. When this is just, it's just a little upside down seven. 
It's just a little L-shaped piece of carbon that goes back there and then we mold a rubber foot over it to make it look good and fit in a shoe. So instead of put it, molding the rubber foot over it, how about we just put the kid's foot over it? That seems bright, right? So we'll take the kid's foot and put it over it and then we put on the, this SMO and a, and a calf cuff on it so that it holds onto their foot and now it's called a carbon seven because it's a carbon upside down seven. Genius. Um, AFO that holds onto the foot and that's really good for kids with spina bifida um, because they don't have any strength. And they would be so, so, so many times I catch myself thinking, oh, they'd be so much better off if we just cut their feet off. Lordy, somebody must, guess somebody just gotta stop me when I'm thinking these things. But when you, when you find those things coming through your head, this is kind of what you want to help them, right? Because they're not better off without their feet most of the time. Um, so this is an, an orthosis. This is actually a UCB. There are no body parts that start with those letters. It is the University of California at Berkeley orthosis, which is a stupid, stupid, stupid name, or a subtalar orthosis, um, but nobody remembers that either. So it was, guess where, guess where they invented it? Right, you know, yeah, Stanford, no, just kidding. <laughs> University of California at Berkeley, that's where they invented it. This is an SMO, the little shorter one, and the combination there that works well together. Oh, he's got a little SMO. They're so cute. I think the SMOs are the cutest. Um, these are indicated, I think the best, what I really started liking these the most for in, in the younger kids is the low tone um, little kid who maybe is a little developmentally delayed, um, especially like Down syndrome. You can look like a genius if you're a 16, 18 month old kid with Down syndrome comes in and um, they're not walking yet and mom's starting to show some concern that they're not walking yet. You write a prescription for Sure Step SMO or any SMO, and they get them, and like two months later, they're walking. You're like, yeah, it's because of me. Um, it's not. They are going to walk anyway. <laughs> it's not because of him either. <laughs> but so this is an SMO, and it, they just barely stick out of the top of the shoe. This is very user friendly. They fit into regular shoe size uh, shoes, and the kids do pretty well with them. They come in giant sizes too for for your bigger floppy kid. This is again not not really indicated in spasticity, but in the kids that have relatively low tone and the kind of those collapsed flat looking feet, those are pretty good to help them. Um, so why not a hinge? The, um, a lot of physical therapists um, wind up recommending a hinge because they, they want the kids to develop better range of motion. I get a lot of complaints that I'm not allowing the kids to have range of motion of their ankles by locking them up in those solid ankle AFOs. And a lot of that is lack of recognition. People don't recognize that a posterior leaf spring is not solid, first of all. It does allow dorsiflexion. Um, uh, I, why not a hinge? Well, I don't, if, you, if, you're, if the child does not have passively pretty easy at least five degrees of dorsiflexion before they hit that rigid resistance, then all that motion that, they're, that they need to have for gait, that they're gonna get through the, uh, hinge is actually going to come through that midfoot and they're going to break down their foot. So what happens when that happens? So this is that a kid similar to the one in the other picture from the front that inside of the ankle is just rubbing over there and it really puts pressure on the shoe and it becomes painful. But more important than that is how do you stop that? Now what? Now what do we do? Now this kid's 12 years old and they're having horrible pain. Well it's just too late to put her in an AFO now because now her foot's all broken down. So now, you want to know what they need now? They Now they need me, not just for my prescription writing skills, okay? Now they need me to actually do a surgery. And the surgery is called a lateral column lengthening. Um, here on this, this is, this is handy because the kid has one affected foot and one, unaff one unaffected foot and one affected foot. So the, if you look at the Taylor head, I like to think of that as your little bald head and this is the hat that's off the side of the head. <clears throat> and you want the hat to be more on the head. You want a line drawn through this bone to actually be parallel to this bone. Um, like so, okay? But it's not. Here, it is not parallel. Here, it is parallel. So we can do a surgery to fix it, but to do this surgery, the kids have to be non-weight bearing on their foot in a cast for, well, first of all, there's the whole pain and the hospitalization and the money and whatnot, the days off school. And then they're non-weight bearing for a minimum of six weeks. Usually it takes them another two or three weeks to really get back to walking after that. Good news is we get good results from it. So you have um, 
from before the foot was broken down compared to the normal foot where they're parallel, and then after the surgery, they do really well. And actually, this x-ray is, uh, I think, three or four years post-op, so it, it maintains pretty well. Hey, three or four years, whoo, that's long-term follow-up in our book. Um, hopefully, it'll last 30 or 40 years, but I won't know them then because, yay, there's pediatric in my name. Um, so this is up on the trunk. We can brace anything. You name it, they got a brace for it. Um, even things I didn't know about, I found out today. So this is a uh, trunk orthosis, or TLSO, that stands for th thoracal lumbosacral orthosis. Um, Marcella has one there. That They can have this harder plastic shell on the outside that's moderately hard. This one's fairly soft, actually. They all have a nice P-light lining because they're going up against your ribs, and we don't want the kids to be uncomfortable. Um, some of the kids with CP or other neuromuscular problems like a lighter weight, more squishy one because they push so hard against it, they cause themselves to have pain. And this is a, chi the, a child with CP without a brace on. This is them with a brace. So not only does it make the x-ray look better, but it actually makes the kid look better because now they're not sitting like this, leaning on their elbows. Now their body is supported and they can actually bring their arms away from their body to use them. So parents usually like this brace. They don't like a lot of braces, but the trunk brace, the, the spine brace, they like. We also have elbow braces. The simplest elbow brace looks like a knee immobilizer. It just goes on to help hold the elbow straight. They can wear it at night to prevent contractures. Some of them are good, squishy padded for the kids that are, have more deformity. Those are great. They're usually very well tolerated and well received by the parents. Um, and they can go to super ridiculously expensive and complex as well. Um, which I think are, this is not great for a little kid because they always find a way to twist out of it, but in your bigger, older kids, it works really well. So why? Why would we bother with all that bracing? We can't really brace rotation very well in the upper extremity. You kind of can, but in CP it's hard because their thumb doesn't stay in the thumb thing that it requires. You have to hold on to something to pull the arm over, right? And that's the thumb because it's sticking out there. So this is your typical kid with a pronation flexion contracture. The treatment for it really in the long run is gonna be surgery because it's very hard to make that significantly better. One of the main things that we can do to make that pronation flexion contracture better is constraint casting. So I got this picture off the internet. Our casts are way cuter, just so you know. Um, but you put the cast on the, on the well side to totally cover the hand and make it so the kid can't even get the fingertips out because if they have just their fingertips showing, they will use that hand like that with the tips instead of using their bad hand. But this is um, causing the kid to use this hand, which normally they would just bypass and use their good hand. So it's a great way to do it. Various different kinds of braces that are available for kids with CP. The upper one is more for nightwear to keep them stretched. And the bottom one is for daytime wear. Why would you put such a contraption on your hand? Why would you do this to your child if your child had CP? Well, you would do it to prevent this. This is a risk fusion that can be done in kids with more severe CP. Why would we, you know, we, we want to prevent surgery as much as we can. I'm a surgeon, and yet I do a lot to prevent surgery. We, we do a lot of major, major hip surgeries to fix things that could maybe be delayed or prevented by the use of a simple brace like this or a simple brace like this that's called a swash brace. Yeah, yeah, I know. So basically, we wind up with this whole big thing. Um, and the whole kid becomes, you know, wh is there a brace? Is there a kid there, or is it just a pile of braces? You know, these families have whole closets full of, of uh, equipment that it takes to manage these kids. But the reason we do it is because, although we are surgeons, thank you very much. We'd rather not. Fair enough. Yes. There we go.